Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace Community Church. Kind of forgot to come up here. Hey, we're going to open up with something really fun and really praising the Lord. If you want to tap your toes, that's okay. You want to clap your hands, it's okay. Anybody wanted to dance around the front, it's probably okay as well, as long as you dance to the Lord. So we're going to celebrate him today. Come awake all of creation The time is come to praise his name All the trees join in the chorus The rocks cry out Good morning, everyone. I'm sure you're awake now, all right? Let's just continue to praise the Lord. Lord, we just thank you that we can join in with all of creation. Where the rocks cry out, the trees are praising, the, the, the waterfalls, everything is created by you and 
through you and for your glory. And we just join into that. Lord, sun and moon and stars are created to praise you and to bring you glory. We join in with that.
Lord, as we approach your throne, we, we, we come with praise and thanksgiving, but now, Lord, we just ask that we would draw near to you. Draw near to your heart today. To set aside every distraction that's happened on our way in. And set the eyes of our heart on you. Draw us in to that place of worship, Lord, where we just sit at your feet. Give you worship and glory you deserve.
right. Amen to every word of that song. Good morning, Grace. I want to invite you to take a seat unless you came in and did not pick up a communion cup. In that case, I want to invite you to go ahead and uh, make that trek over to the tables at the sides in the back of the room. And if you're watching online, I'm glad you're watching. I hope to see you here in person soon. But if you could also grab your uh, bread and your cup and you can partake of communion with us together. Well, guys, uh, I wanted to tell you about a soldier named Joe. I'm going to give you a very abbreviated version of his story. But if you want the full version, you need to come back next Sunday and pick up a, uh, an Advent devotional. It's a little booklet. We put it out every year. And it's written by members of Grace Community Church. And, and um, it, it starts Sunday, the day you get it. And, and there's, there's 28 daily devotionals in there that'll take you straight into Christmas. I've already had a sneak peek at it, and it's really, really good this year. So I want to remind you of that. Uh, this man named Joe I was telling you about, he was a soldier. He was deployed to Afghanistan. He saw a lot of difficult things there. He nearly died on three different occasions. And the last time he nearly died, his life was saved by his squad leader, a man named uh, Sergeant James Traber. Um, he actually gave up his life so that Joe would live. Now you fast forward a couple of years, Joe is now a civilian, he's, he's out of the army, he's gone back home to North Carolina. And his way of dealing with all that he had experienced in the war was to dive headfirst into the bottle. And he abused alcohol, he got into legal trouble, um, and then he, and then he uh, broke his probation. So he went before the judge who had gotten to know him throughout this process, and this judge says, I don't think jail is a good idea for you, but my hands are tied. I have, to, I have to sentence you to one night in jail. But then the judge did something really amazing. He accompanied Joe to the jail cell, to the, to the jailhouse, and had the jailer lock him up in the cell and spent every minute of that day all night long into the next morning in the cell with Joe to calm him down. He probably, honestly, probably saved Joe's life by doing this. Now, um, the local, uh, one of the local news stations got a hold of this. This is how I know about it, because I read about it. They interviewed the judge, they interviewed Joe, and Joe said, I'm a changed man now. I've messed up a couple of times, but when I look back at what these two men did for me, uh, I'm not going to mess up again. Now, guys, I love this story because... Um, well, for one thing, there's three communion messages in here, right? I could spend a few minutes talking about the sergeant who gave up his life so that Joe would live. That's a lot like what Jesus did for us on the cross. And I also could talk about the judge because he took on punishment that he did not deserve. And that's also what Jesus did when he died for our sins. But what I want to draw your attention to is that thing that Joe said. He says, I want to live in light of what somebody else did for me. And... Um, Guys, this is why we at Grace Community Church take communion every Sunday here. We come in here on a Sunday, we get reminded of what Jesus did for us, and the hope is that we would live out the rest of the week in light of that. Now, I'm not talking about being on good behavior or paying Jesus back. It doesn't work that way. The price has been paid. But we live um, in obedience to him as a response to what he has done. Now, I don't say it as well as Paul did, so this is what I'm going to close with. The same thought that I just had is from Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Can I ask you guys to stand and let's pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to pay the price for us. And we ask that you'd help us and guide us this week, Thanksgiving week, and that we would live our lives in gratitude for all he's done for us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Guys, with the heart of celebration, let's eat and drink.
Praise God, you may be seated. This time we want to dismiss those that are serving in Adventureland or in our middle school class. So if you're leading and helping and teaching in any way, you can be dismissed. Young people, you can stand up and be dismissed as well. Kindergarten through fifth grade will go to either side of the worship center and follow the signs to Adventureland. You're a middle school student, seventh.
sixth, seventh, or eighth grade, you'll go out the back of the worship center, across the parking lot upstairs in the Life Center building. Lord, we just speak blessing over our children and those that lead them now. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, church, this is Patrice McLaughlin in Sierra Hill, and we just wanted to come and give glory to God for all of the ways that he has shown himself faithful through Embrace Grace this year. Embrace Grace is a ministry designed to come alongside women who have faced unplanned pregnancy. We come alongside them and just give them support and love and help them to be brave as they chose to say yes in carrying their unborn babies. We have seen him provide miracle after miracle, such as healing one week old Nevea from RSV. Um, he provided rides and transportation for our five blooms to get to class each week. We saw him as our leadership changed uh, through this semester. And um, we also saw him through you, church who prayed and um, provided finances and showed up in a mighty way through our shower this year. Not only by the gifts that you gave and that you brought, but also with your presence. Um, you showed up and you opened your arms and you delivered smiles and you also delivered encouragement um, to our five that walked through um, the, this semester. This semester in Embrace Grace, God really did a lot in my heart. Um, we had some interesting challenges that came up. Um, it was definitely a very diverse group of girls with some really complex challenges. But through that, like I learned the importance of dependency on God in ministry and not growing complacent. And I really got to see God show up, especially at the shower, where the girls were receiving their gifts and they were just in complete shock that God had provided so much for them through this church. If you're interested in jumping in and serving with us, um, you can email eg at gracearlington.com. Good morning. I'm Patrice, and I just wanted to say thank you so much for your love and support um, through Embrace Grace Ministry. I also want to invite you to get involved. Um, we have Embrace Life coming up in January, and then we will also have a new round of Blooms, who are brave girls who choose life for their unborn babies um, in August. So there's two opportunities to get involved. Um, I wanted to welcome you all this morning and welcome to the ones that are watching online. Um, I want to invite you right now to stand up with me and we're going to pray. So Lord, thank you for equipping the church to bridge the gap for these girls and young women who are facing unplanned pregnancy. May you raise up more leaders as we continue to be your hands and feet that abortion would be the unthinkable, for every life is precious in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. So before you sit down, greet your neighbor and share something that you're thankful for as we go into this week of Thanksgiving. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Don Beecham, one of the pastors here at Grace. And we're so glad that you've joined us online today. And I know that for many of you, there's good reasons why you're not here uh, worshiping with us in the sanctuary, but we just want you to know that we really miss you. If it's been a while since you've been able to join us in person, I hope you can return soon. I know you'll benefit from being a part of community and corporate worship, and we'll benefit greatly just from having you here. Well, our fellowship time is almost over here in the worship center. So get ready for some announcements about upcoming activities at Grace, and then have your Bibles and a notebook handy as we prepare for today's message. Thanks for joining.
Good morning, everyone. Whether you're here in service or joining us online, we're so glad you're here. A lot of great things are happening here at Grace, and here are just a few. This season of giving, we're excited to lead four main projects. There's the Park West Angel Tree, gift cards for families, toys and shoes for Mexico, and six ends of the earth Christmas projects. We've recently updated the website to share all the details about these six, and we hope that you will go and check them out and consider how you can give towards these projects this year. Join us on Sunday, November 27th for our Thanksgiving service as we share the things we're thankful for this year, as well as the 35 years that Grace Community Church has existed. We'll also have an open mic time to share a brief Thanksgiving testimony for our church family. And if this is your first time at Grace, come to the welcome area right up front after the service. We would love to meet you and give you a gift. There are so many ways you can serve or find community here. Head to the connection corner in the back of the room after the service, and our team would love to help you get connected here. If you would like to give today, there are boxes around the room, or you can give online at gracearlington.com give, or text Grace Arlington and the amount to 73256. We're so glad you've joined us today. Welcome to Grace. Well, again, welcome. We are glad you're here. Welcome to those of you online. And I just want to say it's great to be back. I just got, we really had just a tremendous time in Kenya ministering to a couple hundred pastors there. And I thought we'd just give you a couple of visuals. Won't take too long on this, but uh, they send a, a blessing. So let's watch that first video. Okay, I think we need more volume on that one. Let's do it again here. It's only 10 seconds. Uh, I don't know if you... I don't know if you could pick me out or not there. I was in the middle. We had so many awesome testimonies of what the Lord did, and... Uh, we put one, one video, about a minute long, of one of the bishops giving testimony. And it was on Facebook, but a lot of you didn't get to see that. So let's take a minute just to hear what he says. Greetings, uh, my brothers and sisters from uh, Grace Community Church. This is uh, Bishop Chris of Word of Life Harvest Church. I just want to share with you the joy that we have with our brother Gary. Since he came here, we have seen God working among the pastors. We have, received, we have received so many testimony from the pastors. They have been blessed. This man of God has been a blessing to our pastors. As uh, the word says that uh, God told Abraham that go and I'll bless you and I'll make you a blessing. Pastor Gary has been a blessing to our group here in Africa. So I'm really blessed and this is my wife. We are blessed. The pastors are blessed. We have so many testimony. Things are happening here. We are praying for this man of God. So he has been a blessing. I just want to thank you, the church, that uh, contributed to the conference. We, they have food, they have where to sleep, they, we gave them some transport. So thank you for supporting the ministry. Praise God. You know, they call him a bishop, but there are over several churches, and we had uh, some there that were over uh, many churches. In fact, one, one pastor, there's over 50 churches and it's going to take all this material back to all the ones he's training. So we praise God for that. Now, one of the things you probably have caught is a bit of our vision, our DNA, our values. You wonder why we send so many people out and where we send them. Our focus is the unreached people groups of the world, the unengaged people groups, those who have not had an opportunity to hear of Christ. We will focus those on those things. We spend hundreds of thousands of dollars doing this every year. But also, another focus we have and another priority, and I kind of capture that, the two bracelets I wear, one says, one with them, and it's a bracelet remembering the persecuted church. And then this bracelet here reminds me of the poor church. Most of the Christians in the world are very poor. Churches are very poor. And so when you see me go somewhere, you'll know that it's to the persecuted church pastors or the poor church pastors in these nations because that, again, is part of our values. We really want to, you know, put uh, resources where there's not resources. And in the United States, there's so many resources available. We take it for granted, but not in most of the world. And so, again, it's a privilege for us as a church to be able to go and strengthen 
a church that is very poor and very persecuted on the world and a focus on unreached people groups. So again, I just want you to, to have high values in that. The money that you give to this church, we place a high priority on those kinds of things because we know that's the heart of Jesus. And so we'll continue to do that. And I do want to say this too, as, as I've had the opportunity to minister in lots of countries, and I come back to Grace Community Church, I want you to know that Grace Community Church is one of the most kingdom-minded churches on planet Earth. I mean, there are more, there's, there's, there is a sense in which God is doing so much what's on his heart through this church, but we want to excel still more. We want to see more and more revival come into every heart in our lives. We want to see revival fires in our places at work, in our, in our places of school, neighborhoods, and so forth. And so, Lord, I think the Lord wants to speak to us about something that is going to help us do that this morning. Now, we're going to continue our series on God's grand story. It's the story of the Bible. And again, we, so far we've divided the Old Testament into six parts so we can get the big picture. And those six parts are beginnings, the book of Genesis, the beginnings, then the wilderness wanderings, you know, primarily under the leadership of Moses, and the next few, few books of the Bible. Then we have promised land, the third part, Joshua, the book of Joshua, the book of Judges. And then we have a section we're calling the United Kingdom, where all of Israel is united under a one king, and that only lasts for three kings, King Saul, King David, and King Solomon. And then we're going to move after that to the, 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 the section we're calling the divided kingdom, where Israel is divided. And then we're going to go to this last section, which is uh, captivity in the coming kingdom. And so right now we're in a section in the Old Testament we're calling the United Kingdom. We've talked about King Saul. We've talked about the, the tension and relationship between King Saul and King David. And now today we want to focus on the life of King David. Now most of us have heard the story of David and Goliath. Now, and also the result of that was a rise for David to power. Remember, that's the story of how little David slew giant Goliath as David fought in faith in the power of the Lord. The result of this tremendous a victory is that David was an overnight success. Uh, he was catapulted into popularity and into leadership in Israel. So a lot of us are familiar with David's rise to power in Israel, but not as many, I don't think, are familiar with his downfall. And that's what I want us to look after, look at today. So David, we see clearly from the Bible, is called a man after God's own heart. He was the ultimate worshiper and warrior for God. His life was the epitome of spiritual passion. But then something happened that brought him down. And I want us to look at that together. That story is in 2 Samuel chapter 11, and I want to read the account, verses 1 through 5, 2 Samuel 11, starting verse 1. It says, then it happened in the spring, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him in all Israel and they destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed at Jerusalem. And now when evening came, David arose from his bed, I guess after his afternoon nap. He rose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. He's bored. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful in appearance. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David sent messengers and took her. And when she came to him, he lay with her. And when she had purified herself from her uncleanness, she returned to her house. The woman conceived 
And she sent and told David and said, I am pregnant. I want you to think about this for a moment. Do you mean it's possible to have the faith to slay a Goliath? To have the humility and the integrity and the loyalty not to lay a hand on Saul, though he was pursuing him to kill him. To be the singer of Israel, the ultimate worshiper, a man after God's own heart, to be all that, and then to come to a place where you could commit adultery without even a struggle. I mean, how could this happen? How could David do this? After all that he had done, how could he do this? What was his downfall? What led to this? Well, David had always led the army. David had always been on the front lines. And now comes the spring. Now, spring was a time for war. Spring was when the rainy season ended in the Middle East. It assured that the roads would be in good condition, at least passable, that there would be much fodder for the war horses and the pack animals, and that the armies that are on the march would be able to raid the fields for food. Spring was a time for war. But this spring, in this account, is different. This time, David sends everyone else out to battle and he stays in the palace. See, David is now expecting others to fight the battles that the Lord is really expecting him to fight and lead. So now something has shifted, and David, uh, instead of zeal, he has, ha he has apathy. Now, instead of him running out to meet the enemy, like he did with Goliath, He's kicking back and he's taking it easy in the palace. So this is the beginning of David's downfall. To withdraw from the enemy is to become vulnerable to the enemy. See, spiritual armor only protects us when we face the enemy. God has designed the saints to be soldiers. All of us. The safest place for us is on the battlefield. To withdraw from the battlefield to pursue a civilian life in the midst of a war sets us up for a fall. You were made for battle. You were made for it. God made you for it. When you came to Christ, he equipped you for it. We are made to give our lives away. We are made to serve the purposes of God. We exist for that. But if instead we change our focus from doing that, and we change our focus to ourselves and trying to satisfy ourselves, something unexpected happens when we do that. Instead of the result of us trying to satisfy ourselves, instead of what we think the result would be is that we'd be satisfied, it's exactly the opposite. When we try to live for ourselves and satisfy ourselves, we actually become unsatisfied. Instead of contentment, we actually become discontented. Jesus said it this way, whoever loses their life saves it. And whoever saves their life loses it. So if you try to save your life by focusing on yourself, you actually lose life. You lose fullness. You lose satisfaction. You lose happiness. That's how it works. That's how the, that's how the spiritual reality works. It doesn't stop there. Here's what happens. If I am now unsatisfied because I've tried to live for myself, I've become unsatisfied. When I'm in that condition of being unsatisfied, I am now vulnerable to lust. Why? Because in your unsatisfied state, you're looking for something to satisfy you, whether it's conscious or not. If you are unsatisfied, you want to be satisfied. And what happens is lust comes along and promises you that it can do the job. 
It can satisfy you. But lust is a liar. Lust only takes, it never gives. In fact, the Bible calls it in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, the Bible calls it the lust of deceit. Lust is deceitful. It promises to fill you, but it will leave you even more empty. It's a liar. It promises whatever that big gaping hole you're filling, that lack of satisfaction, lust says, I can fill it for you. But it's lying. So when you're unsatisfied because you've been trying to satisfy yourself, if you're unfulfilled, you're unhappy, you're bored, watch out because you're now vulnerable to the lust of deceit. Well, that's where David found himself. When he's on that rooftop, he was vulnerable. He had his nap, he's walking on the roof, he's bored. And then he catches a glimpse of this beautiful, naked woman. And lust of deceit says, that's the answer. That's the ticket. That'll fill the emptiness, David. See, when someone comes off the front lines again of ministry and decides they're going to just live for themselves, they actually become not satisfied but dissatisfied, and then they become vulnerable to lust. And that could be lust of the flesh, sexual morality. It could be lust of the eyes, pursuit of money, possessions. It could be boastful pride of life, the pursuit of power or position. But the empty void, that, that discontentment, is demand, it's demanding to be filled. It's demanding it. And lust promises to fill it. Well, back to David. David sins with Bathsheba. He commits adultery. And by the way, he did it with the wife of one of his most loyal men, Uriah the Hittite. was a mighty, one of his mighty men. One of the men that would lay his life down for David, his, his wife. Well, Bathsheba's pregnant. So far, this is kept a secret. David's kept his sin a secret, and he believes he must keep it a secret. So what does he do next? Let me summarize what he does in the rest of this chapter 11. He tries, first of all, he calls for Uriah to come home from the battle. Uriah comes to David, and David says, why don't you go home and see your wife? David's hoping he'll go home, see his wife, have sex with his wife, and then when he discovers she's pregnant, he'll think it's his. But Uriah refused to go home because his men are in the battlefield, they're sleeping outside tonight, so, David, so Uriah says, so I will sleep outside tonight, and he sleeps on David's porch. So that didn't work, so David comes up with another plan. Let's get Uriah drunk, because maybe in his drunkenness, he'll go home to his wife. So he gives Uriah a lot to drink, and Uriah still, even though he's had too much to drink, still won't go home. He still is thinking about his men. It's not right. They can't go home to their wife. I'm not going home to mine. He sleeps on the porch again. So David has to change his strategy in order to keep his secret. So he sends Uriah back to the battle, but he sends a note to the general, Joab, and says, let Uriah be put on the front lines, and as soon as the battle gets heated, pull all the troops back so Uriah is killed. So Joab does what he's commanded to do. Uriah is put on the front lines, they pull back, and Uriah and many other men are killed, all to cover up David's sin. Again, I want you to see what's happened here. First, David comes off the front lines of his calling. Well, then he's focused on satisfying himself. He's now vulnerable to lust. He tries to fill that lust by having committing adultery. And now he is having one of his most loyal men and other men Killed to cover up his sin. What happened to David? You know, sin is actually like a cancer. I mean, it, first it blinds you, and then it hardens you. And then you end up doing things that would have been unthinkable to do just a few months or a few years ago. You know, people who refuse to deal honestly with their sin before God tend to drift further and further away from God. And come to a place where you're thinking, I can't believe 
What happened to me? What happened to me? I don't know how I got where I got. Well, the Bible will answer those questions by telling, by saying, I'll tell you what happened to you, one sin at a time, one sin that you did not confess that you hid, one sin that you did not repent from, one compromise that led to another compromise, one shortcut that led to another shortcut, or one under-the-table deal that led to another under-the-table deal, or one innocent rendezvous that leads to another not-so-innocent rendezvous, and there's a drift. I suspect that room of this many people and those of you online, that that drift is something that some of you are feeling inside right now. You feel the drift. I'm not asking for a show of hands between you and God, but you feel it. Some of you are feeling the drift. So where is it going to go? I mean, how much further will you allow the drift to happen before dealing with the sin? By the way, people better than you and me have ended up in a ditch because they didn't deal with it. Well, David, he goes on with life until the baby's born because of this adulterous relationship, so at least nine months, probably longer. He went on functioning as the king. He went on functioning as the leader of the worship in Israel. He he continued to name the name of God, but inside it's eating him up like a cancer. How do we know? How do we know that's happening? Because David tells us. Psalm 32, verse 3 through 5, listen to what he says. He says, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. Then he summarizes what happened later. I acknowledge my sin to you, my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. He eventually does confess it, but let's stay where he's at first. For a period of about a year, he is hiding his sin, and he is in turmoil. It's eating him up. I mean, he describes what he's feeling. He's alienation, sadness, physical pain. I mean, stuff that none of us would sign up for. Some of you, in all honesty, you're saying, well, that kind of describes how I'm feeling right now. I feel that. I feel that in my life. Some of you are thinking, uh, I, I just wonder if I'm going to be found out. Some of you are thinking, I wonder when I'm going to get the knock on the door or when that phone call is going to come or when I'm going to get that letter. See, there's a certain anxiety that hangs over many people when they're living with a stained conscience. It's like this dark cloud that just follows you. You feel it. You just feel the heaviness. You feel the darkness. For some of you, you have to be honest and say, it's been so long since I felt what it's like to have a clear conscience, to wake up in the morning with lightness of soul and to look out the window and be glad for a day, see the trees and to hear the birds and feel the joy. It's been so long. I talked to a man some time ago who was living with a tortured conscience for years. And finally, his sin was exposed, and he was publicly embarrassed. And he said to me, "Uh, Gary, you know, I'm actually relieved. He said, the exposure and the embarrassment and the penalty is not nearly as bad as the prospect of living the rest of my life with a stained conscience. I wonder if you know, any of you can relate at all to that today. It's like, you're standing, it's like you're behind bars, but the prison keeps getting smaller, smaller, pressing you. Unconfessed sin, it robs us of freedom, it robs us of joy in life. A London psychologist once told Billy Graham that he believes 70% of the people in the mental hospitals of England could be released if they could just find forgiveness. See, the problem was a bad conscience, and you cannot gain relief from it unless you can find forgiveness. So back to David. David is miserable. He's miserable. He's miserable, and the misery is from God. God is, God's hands are heavy on why. So in his misery, he might finally turn and repent so he could be relieved. 
might come clean, might confess his sin. But that, that year-long conviction didn't work. It didn't work. In fact, David doesn't actually confess his sin until Nathan the prophet comes in to his room and puts a finger in his chest and says, you're the man. And, and, he, and he actually, even then, David finally falls to his face. Finally, at that point, he confesses his sin. Nathan the prophet. It could have cost Nathan his life. It was very courageous, but Nathan's going to obey the Lord. The Lord told him to go in there. He did. David falls to his face, cries out to God, confesses his sin. I wonder if you have a Nathan in your life. Do you have anyone in your life that could tell you the truth about you? Is there anyone in your life that knows the truth about you? So Nathan, he confronts David. David confesses his sin. And we know exactly what David says because David tells us. Psalm 51, starting in verse 1. A psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. It says, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you're justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Let's jump to verse 7. Purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. That's what David prays. He prays for cleansing. He prays for the return of spiritual passion because he lost it. Again, let me just review the steps here of what happens, how the most spiritually passionate man could lose his passion. Starts with number one, he left the front lines of his calling. Then he became unsatisfied by trying to satisfy himself, and now he's vulnerable to lust. He gives in to lust, trying to fill that gaping hole, and he sins. Then he tries to hide his sin, keep it a secret. So what was his way back to God? His way back was to repent. Turn 180, confess your sin before God. Tell God, admit it to God, ask him for cleansing. That's what he does. Well, let me ask you as we close here in just a bit, where are you today? Are you on the front lines? Are you fulfilling your calling? Or is your focus to satisfy yourself? Because you're going to be unsatisfied if that's your focus. You were made for spiritual war. You were equipped when you came to Jesus for this. To leave that post is to make yourself vulnerable. So some of you might say, well, I'm on the front lines. I might say, well, stay there. Because you will be tempted to leave there. Don't leave it. Fulfill your calling. Jesus is coming again. You have to give an account for what you did with what he gave you. Part of what he gave you is your calling. Stay on the front lines. Now, some of you say, well, I've already checked out, actually. And, uh, and by the way, once we check out of that, once we back off the front lines, we're real good at defending why. We're real good at rationalizing why. So be careful with that. What David should have done was he's taken a walk on that rooftop. He should have thought, what am I doing up here? And he should have right away just got, got in his horse and caught up with the battle. And some of you probably need to do that today. You're thinking, what am I doing leaving my calling? Well, get on your horse and get back on the, the calling. Now, some of you, you've already left it and you're unsatisfied, you're unhappy, and you're trying to fill that void with something else. One of the bishops that was in these meetings in Kenya, that right before he introduced me, he would ask the question to all these pastors, room full of pastors. He would ask the question, are you happy? 
Are you happy? See, he knows that if they're dissatisfied and unhappy, they're vulnerable. So he's asking a good question. So if you are unsatisfied, you're going, to be, you're going to try to fill that void. You will. Whether you're conscious about that or not, you will. It's demanding to be filled. And lust promises to fill it. But I'm telling you again, lust is a liar. Lust only takes and never gives. Now perhaps you're living in secret sin. And maybe no one in this room even knows. But you know. God knows. And his hand might be heavy on you. You're feeling it. You feel it. Again, I'm not asking for a show of hands, but you feel it right now. It's making you miserable. My question is, are you going to come clean or not? Are you going to finally just say, I'm, I'm going to agree with God about my sin. I'm going to admit it to him and confess it so I can be free. I can be set free. I urge you to do that. I urge you to do that. And there's no better time than now. Don't go another day with the hand of God heavy on you. And don't, bring, don't come to a place where God has to expose you and humiliate you. I mean, come now. I mean, judgment will begin with the house of God. And in the house of God, judgment will begin with the leaders. So I tell you, days of living with secret sin are gone. We're approaching days when God's purifying his church, and his, and his, his patience for that is less and less and less. So we need to confess it. So what does God say that he does with our sins when we confess them? Again, let me just review it for you guys. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Don't you love this verse? By the way, the size of the sin is not the issue. Just come with it. He'll cleanse it no matter how big it is. Isaiah 43, 25, God says this, I, even I, am, him, is, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Another favorite verse for me. In other words, once your wrongdoing has been forgiven by God, he treats, it, he treats you as though it never happened. So why should you keep your wrongdoing alive in your own psyche when God himself has forgotten about it? Micah 7.19. God says he will tread our sins underfoot and hurl our iniquities into the depths of the sea. I would add, and then he puts up a no fishing sign. Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. How far is that? Unending. Again, aren't you getting a glimpse of this amazing grace of God, a forgiveness of God? It's overwhelming. And all this is possible because Jesus went to the cross and hung there and bore our sins, absorbed our judgment, and paid our price. So I want to go ahead and invite Aaron on up here, and Kevin, if you'd come on up. And uh, where is Kevin? Kevin in here? I might ask a couple. Larry, would you go ahead and see if we can get this cross up here in front? It's on, it's on a dolly of sorts. We're going to have this wooden cross up here. And here's what I want to invite you to do. In just a moment... Some of you, God has spoken about something that you, I mean, right away you know what he's talking to you about. I mean, he's put his finger on it. You know what it is. And I would urge you that in just a moment, we're going to have, we have the side tables have pieces of paper and pens. There's also pens in the seat back in front of you. Just take out one of those pieces of paper and write down whatever God, don't put your name on it, but just write down whatever God's speaking to you about. And what I do is I write 1 John 1, 9 right over top of it. And then fold it, and in a moment you can come and you can take a push pin and pin it on this cross up here. And you see, this is, only, this is one side of the cross from first service. The back of the cross also has many that are pinned on there. For some, it's a, it's, it's a big issue. For some of you thinking, you know, it seems like a small thing. Is it really a big deal? And, but yet God's pointing it out to you. 
That's why you're thinking about it right now. And it could be all kinds. It could be a thousand different things here that God is speaking to you about. But God is speaking to you about something that you're coming clean on today. You're going to say, okay, Lord, I confess it to you. And you're going to just write that on a piece of paper, whatever it is, and you're going to fold it up, and you're going to come up here and get one of these push pans, and you're going to put it on the cross. And I want you to do this motion. I really want you to do it. I don't want you to stay in your seat. I want you to do it because you're going to put it in that cross, and when you do, I want you to remember that Jesus paid for you that sin. And just confess it to God and walk out of here with a clean conscience. So whatever it is, don't write your name on it. It's between you and God. Whatever it is, Write it down. Come here and pin it during this song. And Aaron's going to sing Psalm 51 over us. What David prayed, he's going to sing it over us. And my, my prayer is that no one leaves this place with anything left in their conscience. You lay it, give it all to them today. You see, one of the things that I want to see happen here at Grace and around the world is revival. I want to see God pour out His Spirit in a powerful way. I want to see an end-time movement of God and I know that what can hold us back is if we hide our sin. What can hold us back is if we refuse to repent and confess our sin. The Holy Spirit will be quenched. He'll be grieved. And so we want to move forward. We want the, the days of Grace Community Church that are ahead of us far better, far more glorious than the days behind us. And we have to make sure we do this. So I'm going to pray in just a moment. Let's stand up. And I'm going to pray for the Lord to speak to our hearts. And then we're just going to take time to walk up here and pin those things that God speaks to you about. Father, you know, you know us all. You know every detail. So I pray by your Spirit you show us anything that you want us to deal with, anything that you want to put your finger on that we need to confess to you, and we can walk out of here or with a clean conscience. Walk out of here with a lightness of heart and joy. And that you can pour out your Spirit without measure in these days, or these last days. In Jesus' name. So go ahead and feel free to move around the room, get those pieces of paper and write, and come on up here and pin it during this song.
Father, we thank you for forgiveness. We thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for us. We thank you that when you forgive our sins, Lord, you don't remember them. I pray, Lord, you just now pour out your spirit upon us. You fan the flame of passion for the Son of God in each one of us and for the kingdom of God. And you take us further than we've ever gone as a church. We pray, Lord, for spiritual momentum. Pray for our church. We pray for your church around the world, Lord, that you'd fan the flames of revival. Use us this week to that end, in Jesus' name. Now, before we're dismissed, I just want to say that if you're new here, I'd love to meet you over in this welcome corner. If you have any questions for our staff, we have a connection corner. If you have a prayer need, we'll have leaders up here in front. I love you. You're dismissed. <laughs>